All right, here we are, looking at Euthyphro by Plato, another Socratic dialogue. What's the first thing you guys wanted to bring up after reading this? This was by far my favorite dialogue yet, because we just really get down to the Socratic dialogue, and I think this is probably the best example we have of this back-and-forth fact-finding mission that Socrates goes on in these philosophical, pseudo-political, intellectual debates with... Um, what are supposed to be a very intelligent men where he puts uh, Euthyphro in this position where Euthyphro can't actually demonstrate one solid point because of the holes in his logic that Socrates puts forth. And I really enjoyed reading it. Going through Socrates, I think that's one of his biggest strengths is just pointing out holes in other people's arguments and not really being able to fill those holes with anything, which is what I really like about these dialogues. One question. Yeah, I within the uh, dialogue uh, going to the argument that Socrates puts forth is what constitutes piety and impiety? Yeah, and so Socrates and uh, Euthyphro meet outside the court, and of course this is all leading up to the, um, the hearing of Socrates because Socrates has been uh, charged yes. with being impious. and The great uh, trial. Fighting. Corrupting the youth corrupting, of the day. Corrupting Alcibiades, Alcibiades and uh, Critias. And um, so he asked Euthyphro what, what it is to be pious so that perhaps as a, a student of Euthyphro, he can explain his case and be cleared of these charges. Yes, and Euthyphro comes in as this uh, theologian character. So that's why uh, Socrates comes in asking for his guidance. He's the one that has knowledge of the gods. And they say to be pious is to be in accordance of the gods. So he asks for another better definition of, of piety from Euthyphro. Who comes in with his own trial because they're both at the courthouse for their own reasons. And uh, Euthyphro is actually putting forth a trial against his own father. He's prosecuting his own father and his crime being the murder of a servant. Not related, just a serf who worked for his father, who killed another worker, who was beaten and chained up until they could uh, figure out what to do with him from the diviners and while they were waiting let, for... Let me pause you there, though. I don't want you to trip over your words, because he didn't beat him up. He just simply threw him in a ditch, and okay. he, he died of exposure, waiting to hear back from what the gods say. But it's really interesting, because in Greek law, of course, Euthyphro isn't technically in the right in prosecuting his father. In fact, the only members that can lay the charge of murder against his father are those that are related to the murdered... Uh, yeah. victim. So only their family members are, are technically allowed to lay this charge of murder, but he being a just and theological man knows that this is an impious act and that he would be in the wrong if he were not to do something about it. And that's why he's brought this charge upon his father. Yeah, and, and that's another huge example of how much our law has inherited from these Socratic dialogues. Because the only reason we see this as like a normal and just thing to do, like trying your own father for murder, is because of these conversations and all the stuff we've inherited from the ancient Greeks. And of course, so with all this posturing Euthyphro's done and explaining what it is that he's doing to Socrates, Socrates says, well, if you are so certain of the fact that this must be done, like something must be done about this, you must know all about piety and impiety. So please, I am but a fool, would you teach me? And we enter into the dialogue of, of the five definitions of what piety is. Yeah, and the most important part, I think, is that Socrates is actually coming from a place of, you know, actually believing the words that he's saying. He's saying, like, I obviously don't know anything about piety if you're coming along with this utmost pious virtue for, of prosecuting your father. This is, of course, a, a prime example of Socratic irony, which is uh, discussed quite a bit. But uh, just getting into the start of it, you read it and you're like, there's no way that Socrates actually feels this way. And he's just kind of 
being coy. Yeah, like one of the most popular quotes from Socrates is, all that I know is that I know nothing. And that's a, that's just part of his worldview. There's always something to learn. So we get into the first definition, which is Euthyphro says, well, piety is doing what I'm doing, prosecuting my father, just as Zeus prosecuted his father and his father before him prosecuted his. Yeah. What did you think of that definition and the holes that were put into it? Well, I think it's part of it to not be afraid to prosecute your own father, to not let the fact that they're related to you by blood distract from the fact that what they did was a crime and it's wrong and they should be punished even though there's no one there to punish them. So indifference in the face of relation when an a unjust and immoral act is committed to do uh, what one can to seek out justice. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Yeah. So I really like the whole Socrates put it in, of course, because there's a, a whole pantheon of gods at this point, and his argument is, yes. well, first of all, that's just an example. It's not a uh, universal which is something that Socrates is seeking out, a universal truth about piety that may be applied to any example of any action so that Socrates may know at a very ground level what piety is and that this is simply an example of what could be considered piety, but is he's not convinced because, of course, the gods find certain things to be good and certain things to be bad, and they disagree quite a bit. Yeah, and Socrates never says the words, I, I disagree with you. I don't think this is actually a pious act. He just says, I'm, I'm looking for a more specific definition that I can apply to myself in my own troubles here. I got a situation myself that I think piety can help me with, but if you're just giving me an example of going against my father, then that doesn't really help me much. But at the same time, I'm not refuting what you're saying. He certainly doesn't refute it up front, not not at first, but as we get into more of the definitions, he certainly makes a good argument for how it could be refuted. Never he displays, doing the refuting. He displays his skepticism. I think in in the third definition, he gets into more of a, like a, a law-based argument as to why it could be conceived that what he is doing is not pious, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Yes, because after that example, Euthyphro puts forward the definition of that which is dear to the gods is pious and holy, and that which is not is impious and unholy. And which is where we get to some really fun wording on Socrates' part, because he talks about the dichotomy that's drawn because, between... So he says, that which the gods are pleased with is pious, and that which pleases the gods is pious? And he asks himself, so, so, okay, Euthyphro, is that which is pious pleasing the gods, or is it because the gods are pleased by it that it's pious? Yes, a little bit of a chicken or the egg conversation. And I love it, because when you actually, like, like when you take this out into the real world and, and you talk with someone, and you ask them their opinions about something, you can really look at their sentence and, and look at the logic behind what they're saying like as a as a study like in computer science we study logic and if this then that and this or that equals this and and all of a sudden euthyphro's argument stops being sentences and pleasing socrates but actually this mathematical sort of syntax based dissection of his words i want to read this one quote that he says and a thing is not seen because it is visible, but conversely visible because it is seen. Nor is a thing led because it is in the state of being led, or carried because it is in the state of being carried, but the converse of this. And now I think, Euthyphro, that my meaning will be intelligible, and my meaning is that any state of action or passion implies previous action or passion. It does not become because it is becoming, but it is in a state of becoming because it becomes. Neither does it suffer because it is in a state of suffering, but it is in a state of suffering because it suffers. Do you not agree? Yeah, and uh, it's kind of hard to dissect that one at first glance. I had to read it over a couple times. I really like...
liked it because it, it's just again it's it's talking about tenses of words and the implications that come from it and like the whole something that you're carrying isn't in a state of carried because it is in a state of carried it's in a state of carried because you're carrying it which means the, the very root of that sentence is that it, it's not carried because it's carried it's carried because you're carrying it which is then tied back this analogy to is something pious because it's loved by the gods or do the gods love it because it is pious yeah I, this is definitely the where Euthyphro gets caught up in his words a lot and they say the argument walks away from him. He gets confused by the the sheer logic of the situation. Yeah, he just gets caught up in semantics and doesn't know where to go from there. And there's, a, there's another example that he takes as well from the poet Stasinus who sings, O Zeus, the author and creator of all these things, you will not tell for where there is fear, there is also reverence. And Socrates disagrees, saying that we may say that wherever there is reverence, there, there will be fear, but not wherever there is fear, there will be reverence. Yes, because the poor person does not revere the state which causes his poorness. He simply fears it. Yes, exactly. And it doesn't really work both ways. And that kind of leads into that fourth definition, that piety is a species of genus justice or just. Yes, it's a, it's a part of it. It's a member of justice, so to speak. Which is compared to numbers, right? That an odd is part of number, but number isn't necessarily odd, because of course there's even. Yes, exactly. My issue with this whole dialogue, of course, is that we don't get to a definition of what piety is. You know, you don't read use it, bro, and say, oh, okay, I now know how to act pious. The argument runs full circle three, four, five times, and then the court hearing comes up, and Euthyphro has to leave, leaving Socrates without an answer to his question. Yeah, it's structured a lot like Carmides in that way, too. The first one that we read, that by the end of it, you're left with more questions than answers about what is temperance or what is piety. Yeah, I found it was like Carmides light. You know, it was very to the point, and it was back and forth and back and forth. There was no additional parties jumping in. It was very easy to get through and, yeah. and enjoyable to get through. There was more urgency the to the conversation, sure. too. Like, they're both waiting to go on trial, and uh, in Carmides, they're just sitting, in, just hanging out, looking at little boys. <laughs> yeah. That's the question that I posed earlier. What constitutes piety and impiety? Is piety a god itself? Or is it outside the reach of a god? Hmm. Are the gods pious? Is that your question? Yes. Or are they not? Is it something that they have to search for? I would have to lean on the Socratic definition um, in the second one, that the gods disagree with each other. So depending on who you ask, I think particular gods are pious. But if you asked another, that that same god would be considered impious. I think every god considers themselves pious and other gods with different levels of impiety because they believe themselves to be the most pious. Therefore, someone... Any mortal being pious could be pious to one god, not to another. Which is where um, so Socrates makes the argument that perhaps what Euthyphro is doing isn't pious in many views and pious in others, that the act of prosecuting a father for uh, inadvertently killing a slave that killed another slave would be contrived as impious by many a god and so you have to choose your gods i suppose to but, align with your life but then they imply that there's some things that all the gods do agree on which is considered to be pious and if you like uh perform an act that is considered pious to only a few gods then that wouldn't be pious at all that would or impious it would just be neutral Makes me speculate if all the gods consider the god Eros that was discussed in the previous book, if they consider him to be a pious god. Love, the god of love. Hmm. 
because they went into great detail saying love is in everything. And if, if love is in everything and that love is the creator of all things and that all gods do create to some degree, that love would have to be involved. And so they obviously do love things and those things they love are pious. Therefore, I would assert that the God Eros of love is a pious God and all things done in love could be con considered pious, perhaps. Then the question is, love of what exactly? Because it certainly can't be love of your father if you're prosecuting your father, right? No, I think in this case, Euthyphro's love here is of justice. Yes, but it is love nonetheless. Another thing that uh, Euthyphro puts forward is the part of justice that attends to the gods, and they talk about attention for a little bit. And Socrates says, but what form of attention do you mean? Surely you can't mean the, the attention that a, a horseman shows his horse or a hunter shows his dogs. And then he goes in, no, it's about how a, a server attends to his master. That's how you would attend to the gods if you were being truly pious. Yes, without making the gods better or believing that you would through your actions, but simply in honor and esteem and prayer for the gods. Because in most all other cases Socrates discusses, the attention is to make something better. But when it comes to the art of sacrifice and prayer and this exchange it, it isn't to better the gods, but to, to be in tribute to the gods. Mm-hmm. And Socrates at one point calls it the science of asking and giving to uh, match with prayer and sacrifice. Which seems like a very fine line to walk, this belief that what you're doing for the gods is pious without having any benefit for the gods. The whole nature of doing something for another, as Socrates discusses, is to better that something. Wherever attention goes, betterment comes, except for in the attending of the gods. Which kind of presents it as almost like your duty. You're not getting anything out of it, you're just preventing it from decaying. Kind of like an upkeep. Mm -hmm. You have to serve the gods if you expect the gods to continue what they give you, which is literally everything. You just yeah. don't you just don't see it as the gods giving it to you because you know that's just everything that there is. So sacrifice is more like an upkeep and as we talked about before just maintaining what you have for the future to what you already have today. Exactly. And we do get into that it's fairly touched on, but we do talk about in this book about Socrates's daemon which is this holy symbol or visitation of knowledge that comes to him. I don't know, um, because again, I haven't really read much about Greek philosophy and Socrates, and so going through these first couple books, I was really in the dark. I knew of the Socratic dialogue, I knew of fallacious arguments, but I didn't know any of the backstory, and I'm pretty sure it was posited that Socrates was schizophrenic, and he was receiving messages, and that's what got him into trouble, is that he was bringing new gods to the table and disposing of these older gods. And that's why the Athenians were upset with him. Yeah, Euthyphro goes over that in the very beginning when he says, like, oh, you have these demons or thoughts that just, or spirits that just come to you, and you say that's where some of your genius thought comes from. But, I don't know, it's hard to say if it's, like a, a mental illness like schizophrenia or something like that or if he's just a super genius like Elon Musk who's always got thoughts going through his head yeah and I know that he does definitely pursue the truth I think at his core regardless of the fact that his entire state is at war at this point he's simply opening up these dialogues with people of intelligence and stature and democratic prestige about truth and the pursuit of truth regardless of the situation he just wants to know what the truth is and i think at some point he even stated that the majority agreeing upon something has nothing and very little to do with the truth and that perhaps a philosopher god king would make a better leader mm -hmm. 
that, that's not in this book. That's just simply on my, my further readings as I get more interested in Socrates. But this whole notion that one person might be better if they knew what the truth was and had right knowledge and were able to act in a way that would benefit all of society, that they might be better off than a, a majority governance. Yeah. Like they talk about that a little bit in the Republic. I look forward to it. And yeah, there's there's really something to be said about the pursuit of truth being like even more significant than anybody's own well being. Just truth is more important than anything else. And it's so in my work, like when I'm coaching with someone, when when you're exploring what someone's problem is, this Socratic dialogue is one of the best tools because you really explore what the problem is by turning it into syntax like someone says oh well i'm anxious when i go outside and then you turn around and you say are you anxious every time you're outside or are you anxious in particular moments when you're outside is outside just the definition of anxiety for you or are there particular moments where because of what you're going to do outside you get anxious can you be not anxious outside and it's this circling of the problem to really hash out where the anxiety comes from in this example um in that individual's mind because for example if someone gets anxious when they want to go shopping and they're anxious before they get to the grocery store and on the way to the grocery store and when they're outside the grocery store. But once they've done all their shopping and they've paid for their groceries on the way back to the car, they might tell you, well, I'm not anxious anymore because the task is done. And you say, well, that's interesting because you told me that you get anxious when you're outside. But when you're outside and you've done what you need to do, you're no longer anxious, which means that you're not always anxious when you're outside. You think maybe you could be not anxious more times that you're outside which is then something you'd be open to and it's it's fun to be able to circle around a sentence and really hash out what the logic and the statement implies because many people don't actually know what what their implications are when they say something that's definitely <laughs> true that reminds me of a, a jordan peterson example too he talks a little bit about sometimes uh this person that he was working with that was afraid of elevators or whatever said well why are you afraid of elevators and how about you just walk into an elevator and you know we won't move it or anything we won't close the door just walk in walk out we'll see how that goes for it then we'll then we'll put you inside an elevator then we'll close the door then open the door and then you can leave and just slowly build your way up and figure out what exactly the anxiety triggers are and how best to go about it yeah, and I think we're very ignorant to what our, our own implications are much of the time. Absolutely. And that is why this reading is, is of such benefit, you know, to, to be able to see an argument like piety circled so vivaciously by Socrates makes you wonder what else could be circled. And, and the, the notion of that piety is a species of genus just is, a really interesting one. I really like that definition and, and the holes that he put in that argument because now we're really defining what words mean and that words are related to more words and that they're not just these solo entities that have implicit meaning, but that all communication is built on an underlying structure and template. And so when we say something, then it is built on something that was said before and that these things are categorized and through these categorizations, we can make sense of the whole. Yeah, and I think it would be a little bit less productive of a piece of writing if they just gave us a proper definition of pious and impious at the end. Because it forces you to really ask the questions for yourself, not just read the question, read the answer, move on and try to apply it to your life. You actually have to ask the questions yourself and then go deeper into it from there i want to kind of just dip our toes into like christian gods with these definitions kind of cross-examine this whole notion that gods disagree and agree with certain things right because if if piety is doing as the gods approve and pleasing the gods and doing what the gods love and that it's a species of justice and that it's an art of sacrifice and prayer and we say, okay, well, what does Satan like? All of a sudden, all of these definitions 
could be flipped on their head. If you look just very basic binary, Satan and God, and you say, because of course Satanism is a thing, and devil worship is a thing, and there are many people who go through their lives believing that Satan and chaos are much better ruling structures, and they do what they think their God would love, whereas the other Christian God, God, would completely disagree. And so you have to wonder just how objective or subjective, I should say, piety really can become for the individual. I think that's a, a unique one because Satan is more like a, he's just a fallen angel, so he's more like an underling. He's just a, a symbol of open rebellion rather than I know. an equal to I know that. God. Um, it's certainly, if you were to read the Bible, you'd, you'd gain that understanding, but... I'm not so much speaking about the true definition of what Satan is, but more of the perceived societal yeah. definition that there is this anti-God that is equal to or greater than the good, and he is this force and representation of this evil. Yeah, but I, people... I think in a way that Satanism just kind of translates into a hatred for the divine rather than a worship for certain values. It's more of like a symbol of just absolute rebellion instead of like sticking to anything. I have met with people who fully worship at the altar of Satan and believe that their right path to walk is in embracing their most favorite sin and living it up to their highest ability. So I don't speak to the higher levels of thought in this. Situation. I speak to the, the misconstrued understanding. I got you. The subjective morality of Satan worship. I haven't read the Satanist Bible, so I can't really, I can't really speak too much on that then. <laughs> no, my, myself neither. I've only spoken with people that really believe that um, if they think murder is what they're put on this planet for that Satan built them that way and they ought to do Satan's work. And it was a very odd conversation to say the least, but in their subjective worldview, what they're doing is right. I mean, I wasn't talking to a murderer. I was just speaking to a, a, a an individual who represented the world of living in sin. Huh. So I in guess, a, I guess case, a, a drug addict. Yeah. So I guess in that sense, you could definitely draw some parallels to, uh, what we were talking about with uh, paganism and the Greek gods, that if you just chose the god of war, let's say, and dedicated your whole life to living with the virtue of war, that wouldn't be considered yeah. pious to most of the gods. But it, it, So you, if you pick your gods and your actions, then your actions are pious in the eyes of those gods. And there was enough gods, certainly in Greek times and other religions, that you could say, well, actually, I follow this God, and this God says this action is good, and I know this because that's how we built this God, so that he would justify our good actions. It's a bit horrifying with those definitions. Yeah. Do we eventually become gods ourselves? I think that's the whole metaphor, really. I mean, I don't know. I'll let you know when I'm dead. Um, I'm pretty sure gods were modeled after men. I don't think gods made men. I'm, I'm, I leave room for um, information. I, I am agnostic, so I'm not certain what the end game is. But I think we made gods to explain the absorbent or absurd actions of men. And then 100 years went by, and we just kind of took it as rote and said, okay, well, there's this god, so I'm going to do this thing. But realistically, I think piety and impiety needs to come into the hands of man. I think we need to collectively establish the rules for benefit of mankind. And I think it's very interesting to debate what is good and what is bad when you look at how a bad thing affects the whole on a certain timeline. You can see that destruction does lead to greatness in many instances throughout history, that certain things do need to die in order for new things to grow. And this whole idea that we could know whether or not one action on its own put under a microscope is pious or impious is very hard for us to say in our limited time span. Yeah, and an atheist might make the argument that uh, arguing about the Bible or arguing about the gods is about equivalent as arguing about Star Wars fan fiction, right? 
because they just see it yeah. as a useful fiction to live in. Yeah, another hero with another face. Yes, exactly. It is hard to speculate on what is good and what is bad when, when put under such lenses, though. I, I think like we are all doing the best we can with the resources we have, and mayhaps we don't know just how screwed up we are until we get some new perspective-shifting event, and then we reflect on our past 10 years and say, my goodness, I was off track. Or perhaps we say, oh, wow, I'm, I'm right on track, and I, I am further justified in my actions by this event. But to, to look at someone under a microscope and say what you're doing is wrong without getting to know the situation is, is very difficult. 100%. I think it's a lot easier if you go into it with some ground rules, some universals, which is don't take away people's rights. Um, don't impose your views on people. Don't rape kill and steal from people. I think if you go into that with these universal understandings that perhaps that doesn't help, then at a day-to-day a -day level, that makes your decision-making process a bit easier. You know, eat food, do good work, love what you're doing, and provide for others. That's easy. But when we enter into a situation like war or diplomacy, all of a sudden, the rules change, it seems, at least historically. Because mm -hmm. everyone, every different culture comes up with a different set of rules. Like the Hebrews came up with the Ten Commandments, and before that we had Hammurabi's Code. And then how long did mm -hmm. it take to get the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and you know the Charter of Rights, the parliamentary system? Whatever, whatever you want to target, like everyone comes up with I, a different set of rules all over the world and through different parts of time. It's a never-ending struggle. Yes, and I think uh, the biggest struggle of humankind is just to figure out a way for all of us to live in unison under the same set of guidelines or rules. And religion kind of stops us from doing that when we're all arguing over what God tells us to do instead of mm -hmm. hey let's yeah, just figure out the rules for ourselves and then we'll call that god and this goes back yeah. to what we read in symposium when socrates mentions that we should look at everything from a we should look at everything in multiple tiers like we look at the science first which are the basics and then we work our way up towards enlightenment as we age and figure out the ones that are right for us. And I do fear that is all we ever can do. That there is no shining, overbearing, pious truth to the world. That based on the context, there's going to be right decisions and wrong decisions. And that they'll be clear to the individual and perhaps the observer, but never definable as a universal truth for what makes a pious action. Yeah not one that can be carried over the ages at the very least. Is there any other notes we wanted to go over on this one? It was a shorter dialogue. We, I think we went pretty hard pretty fast on this one, but like, I think we've covered most of the bases. I think this dialogue is probably far more interesting than Symposium, in my opinion. I mean, both, both dialogues cover a lot of ground, but I think this one went into more detail. Yeah, it goes deeper into a single question rather than just gloss over the whole of one subject. Yeah, yeah, it really took one particular thing and went around it for quite some time, whereas we had multiple opinions in the symposium kind of sharing their own take on it, their own subjective view of it. Yeah, like I said this before, like I said before, there was more of an urgency to this conversation because... You're both on their way to do something, but Socrates just needed to know what piety was so it would help him. Oh yeah, I was going to add I had one more thing that I wanted to say. I just thought it was uh, kind of weird that the theologian Euthyphro was completely fine with the accusation of Socrates being the one to 
you know, create these gods. When Euthyphro was like considered to be the most pious and you know had the most knowledge of the gods, Euthyphro didn't seem to be mad at Socrates at all for being the one to corrupt youth with knowledge of all these false gods, as people say. Which I find odd, and I, I've tried to find where exactly Socrates discusses new gods, and I, I am yet to find that book and what new gods he proposes. Maybe it's just like a, a metaphor for how he treats the... Like when people see the gods as just one absolute fact, and Socrates comes along and says, well, what do you mean by that? They're kind of treating that as like an attack on their gods and saying, well, are you calling the, these gods that, we, that we've worshipped forever not real gods? Is that what you're saying, Socrates? And he's just like, no, I'm just trying to learn the true nature of these gods. And they kind of perceive that as an attack on the gods and a, a splitting of the gods and a creation of new gods rather than just a, a true um, pursuit of knowledge. Yeah, I think they really were just thrown off by his very existence and were very fearful of him, and that he became a bit of a scapegoat in these times, blamed with the birthing of oligarchic rule and such. And it goes through uh, Euthyphro saying that, like, uh, whenever I say such things, people just laugh at me and call me crazy. And Socrates says, well, I wish they would do the same thing to me. But now I'm on trial for corrupting the youth because they trust in what I say more than they trust in what you say. Mm-hmm. Well, shall we call it there, folks? All right, sounds good. May the force be with you, lads, and have a good day. Same with you.